Well, I am extremely blessed to be here with Ruth Douthit. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm, it's just a treat. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly enough, Ruth and I have been connected for a very long time. Um, and yet we hadn't met a lot. So it, growing up, I had a pencil drawing of an eagle that hung on the wall in my house. And she's laughing. And uh, I, you know, we would always say, who is that? Oh, Ruthie. Ruthie drew that. And she was a, a girl in our high school group. My parents were high school ministers for a while. And uh, oh, Ruthie from our high school group uh, drew that. And then you've kind of like woven in and out. You, you know, taught my brother art lessons. And um, then you were connected with many of my uh, author friends. And I was like, wait, I know, I know her. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I know we have so many of the same friends. I'd see you it's like true. their posts or they would like your posts. And I'm like, how do you know, Courtney? This uh -huh. world is so small. <laughs> I know. I know. So I'm so happy to be talking to you here. Thank you. I'm um, honored to be here. And my dad says hi. So <laughs> oh, tell him I said hi back. Uh, well, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself other than the fact that you obviously uh, draw pictures of eagles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I am a professional artist mm -hmm. and an author, published author, teacher, uh, Bible study teacher and wife, Christian wife and mom to Nathan. And right now I work over at Grand Canyon University in their curriculum department. And I uh, used to teach middle grade, middle grade writing courses. And I've taught a whole bunch of art courses over at Glendale Community College. And uh, yeah, so it's just been one wild ride. I started off as a student at Grand Canyon College back in the day. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's when I first started studying art. So yeah, I've come full circle now and just uh, yeah. enjoying life. Tell me about your art and your writing. What is it that you love so much about them? Oh, well, art for me is like breathing. You know, mm. I have to do it or I die. <laughs> and <laughs> It's, it's really easy for me. I think since I was like five years old was the first time I realized I was an artist and could, you know, draw. Mm -hmm. It was the way I made friends. You know, I was very, very shy as a kid. And when we go to the mm -hmm. library, all my friends would run to the Judy Bloom books and I would go grab a encyclopedia and of horses and sit down and just draw horses the whole time. <laughs> and then before you knew it, I had five or six friends around me saying, draw me something, draw me something. So uh -huh. it's just always been something that's my identity. I recently reconnected with a whole bunch of grade school friends on Facebook and they all remembered me for being an artist. So it's just has always come easy for me. And my son was is made a very astute comment way back when he was in high school. He himself, himself is an artist and he had to do a project in art class. So we were working on it together. And he said, mom, for me, it's a, art is a lot like it was for you. It seems to be to come easy. And I said, yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. He said, but basketball for me is a lot like how writing is for you. It, it takes more work. And I said, yes, that is so true. Writing for me does not come easy. It's, it came to me later in life. It's just, it's a lot of work, totally different than art. But mm -hmm. I find it to be a really neat challenge. It's so much fun to go from start to finish and you're holding that book in your hand or, or you see other people reading your book and it's like, wow, this is so cool. So I think for me, it's all about the expression. You know, the fine arts are all about expressing ourselves. I mean, singers sing to be heard and musicians play to be heard and artists, we draw and paint to be seen and, you know, and we write to be read. So we just, we're, we're all part of God's creation. He's the great creator. So we're created in his image, right? So it's no surprise that we long to be known. We long to be seen. And so we create, we create. So I think that's, for me, I think that's why I've always just tried to inspire others, you know, to express yourself, use it as a means of expressing yourself. So, mm -hmm. so you love writing so much <laughs> that you thought, hey, uh, let's talk to other writers <laughs> and I'm going to create not one podcast, but two podcasts based solely around books. So you have a Writer's Day podcast 
in which you interview authors and talk about their books that they've got coming out. And then you have the Broken Vessels podcast, which uh, is specifically for Bible studies. Yes, that's um, only Bible studies. That I've yeah. Written. Yeah. So what have you learned as you've interviewed authors and listened to them talk about their journeys? Oh, wow. Well, as authors, we're told to build our platform. That's like mm. a huge thing that publishers want us to do. So I, I had a blog a long time ago and they're just not taking off, you know. I was say when that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just like, I don't blog anymore. So uh, just a few years ago, I started listening to podcasts and I thought, well, that's something I could do. I'll just take the blogs I've written and then just tell them, tell stories. Mm. And when I was in the classroom, I used to share, I used to tell like four or five stories a week with my students, like at the start of class, because writing is storytelling. So I thought, well, I'm just going to start a podcast and just share writing tips like I used to do in my classroom and interview authors to tell their stories. How did they become, how did they go from writers to published authors? Because those stories are often so inspirational. And mm -hmm. when I feel really down about my own writing journey and I'm like, oh, why am I doing this? This doesn't make any sense. I should just give up. Um, the Lord will bring an author into my life and I'm hearing her story and she just starts hitting these main points of how she wanted to quit and she was despondent and then boom, it just happened for her. So after each interview, I always tell them, you know, I, I always pray before uh, an author comes on my podcast and I wonder what does God have for me to learn from them? And sure enough, after every interview, I can go back and pinpoint exactly what God wanted me to hear from this person. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And so that's my hope is that my listeners are getting that too, that they yeah. are learning more about the publishing industry and about perseverance and you know dedication and discipline that it takes to become a writer but that they're also encouraged to keep going. Mm -hmm. So many people want to just give up and quit. But once you hear, you know, Susie Mae Warren's story and Rachel Houck's story, and you know, you hear their stories of how they have just persevered through so much, you just can't help but be inspired and want to go right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the main reason I did it was to build my platform, to tell stories, to give writing tips to authors out there and then to have them listen to well-known, best-selling, award-winning authors mm -hmm. to get encouragement. You know, and it it's so, it's one of those things that I don't think you really know happens until you're actually doing in that. And that is that how much you learn when you're doing podcasts or as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I find there's a lot of things that my students could teach me that I didn't know before or really probably would have never known because they're bringing their own life experience into the classroom. So I, I totally get that, that you're learning as you are interviewing. And I think in, in most, because most podcasts are really just a conversation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can plan the questions, but the answers are going to go where they're going to, wherever they're going to go, wherever God wants them to go. And sometimes they take the coolest turns uh, as far as, you know, who, who we're talking about or, or what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now you said earlier, and I forgot to mention this, you said <laughs> that writing is hard for you, but you've written 14 books. <laughs> <laughs> How does that fit together? Like I'm writing a very small devotional book that I am hoping to get out soon. And it is a chore let me tell you <laughs> and you've written 14 books why do you keep doing something that's hard for you <laughs> oh good question um I liken it to running to tell you the truth I mean my son asked me one time mom why do you run these ridiculously long distances and without even thinking about it I said for the challenge for mm -hmm. the challenge and it's a lot with writing it's the same thing with writing I mean, you get an idea and there's a challenge to communicate it to someone. And that's why I used to tell my students, you have to be effective communicators. You know, that's what writing is. You can have this cool story in your head, but to put it down on paper, you know, in such a way that somebody could read it 
and follow that storyline to the end and just get it, you know, that requires a lot of skill. Yeah. So my first book wasn't that great. I just got it down. You know, I wrote it from 2004 to 2008. So four years of writing. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I had a story in my head and I had to get it down hmm. and uh, gave it to my editor. And he was fantastic, you know, very well read. Uh, he had worked over at Disney. And so he knew story and plot. And so he was the one who just ripped it to shreds and helped me put it back together again. And I developed a very thick skin with him. Uh -huh. And so he was the one that kind of helped me get from point A to point B, you know, act one to act three. And then, um, like you were saying, I, when I started teaching writing, I became a better writer because I was teaching grammar. Mm. I was teaching, you know, how to structure writing, all these writing tips, you know, and everything about plot and characters. And as I was teaching it, I was teaching myself. So then my second book, I handed to my editor and he was like, wow, I'm in like chapter four and I haven't even edited anything yet. And he goes, your writing has improved tremendously. And I was like, wow. yay. And I said, it's because <laughs> I'm teaching it, right? I'm teaching writing. So it just, as the more you write and you get tips and stuff from your readers, you know, you take that into account. And then I read books too. And I see how other authors are doing it. And I've taken courses. I've gone to writing conferences to learn the craft. It requires a lot of humility. Not that my artwork doesn't either. Cause I've like you, I've had to have it critiqued by the best, you know, of the mm -hmm. best, but for my writing, it required a lot of humility when to sit in front of somebody or just this week, I got a critique back from a publisher on my book that I gave to them. And he gave me some fantastic feedback that maybe for someone else, it would have made them cry. But for me, I was like, yes, this is what I need. I need to know what I was doing wrong, right? So I can go back and fix it. And he basically said, you're doing a great job. You're really good at writing. I understand this, this. However, you're missing this, this, this. And I was like, yes, that's what I need to hear. So it requires humility. It requires a thick skin and an, uh, the desire to want to always be improving, continuously improving. Mm. So I, mm. I talk with other writers. I meet with writers groups. I go to conferences. And with my art, you're, you're always improving too, just like with, mu with your music, right? I mean, you haven't yeah. made it. You, you're always, always learning from those who are better than you. And so I do that as well. But for writing, it's just like you said, it's a chore. You have this idea, but you have to sit down and get it done mm -hmm. and nobody else can do it for you. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's work. It is work for me. For others, yeah. not so much. For them, it's like, oh yeah, I can whip out five books a year, pow, pow, pow. And I'm just sitting there like, how do they do that? And I, I literally have spoken to authors who do that four or five books a year. So, but for me, it is a chore. It is work. Wow. And I think one of the interesting things, even probably it's encouraging for your uh, students in the past or, or authors that you're talking about, you are probably encouraging them by saying, this isn't easy. <laughs> You know, like when yep. you hear someone's like, yeah, I, I just sat down and I wrote it. And, you know, within a month, the book was done. And, and, and you're, and, and as another author is sitting there like myself trying to just, you know, <laughs> sitting there with a couple days, I know that there was something I was trying to write and nothing came out. Like I, everything that I wrote, I erased because I'm like, no, it, that, that doesn't, no, no, that's not right. <laughs> you know? Um, and I eventually just had to stand up and do something else and came back and finished writing it later. But I, I'm sure for other writers like, like myself, I am not a writer. I'm an aspiring writer. Uh, but <laughs> it is encouraging to hear that here you are on your 14th book, having that released in February and it just still doesn't come easy, but it's something that you love and it's, it's something you're passionate about. And I feel like as a teacher, we do the same thing when we are discipling or mentoring someone. Mm -hmm. The fact that we are always learning, we are never, um, like we've never arrived. Right. And we're always walking alongside people because we have stuff we can learn from them and then they have stuff that they can learn from us. And so discipleship is this side by side picture. And it sounds like in your teaching and, and even your conversations, you're having these side by side relationships with your students, with other authors, where you're both encouraging each other. There's this mutual uh, uh, um, 
this mutual learning that's happening. Now, I know that you've taught writing in the past. Um, you've taught art. You, My brother is an artist. Uh, hi, Caleb. And <laughs> he's now a tattoo artist and uses his art in many different ways. Um, but you gave him some lessons when we were younger. That poor kid. Yeah, I barely did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor no. Guy. <laughs> poor guy. Uh, no, he, you know, when you're looking at these young artists, whether it is a visual art or writing, what, 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 where do you start to help these young aspiring artists? And why is it so important to find mentorship in the art world? Because I think sometimes uh, you can see people say, oh, I don't need anybody. Like, I'm just going to sit here and draw and draw and draw. Or I'm going to sit here and I'm going to learn new music and I don't care what anybody else thinks. And I don't care if they like it or not. I'm going to produce my art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't last very long <laughs> in the art world. <laughs> so why is mentorship so important? And and what does it love that you help about? What is it you love about <laughs> helping shape these art artists? Well, you know, it's the challenge. You need to have somebody to come alongside you and challenge you. If you're if you're hanging out with people who just say, yes, that's wonderful all the time, you know, you're just not going to learn from it. And yeah, you can't and, surround yourself with yes men, right? Exactly. You need at least a you couple can't. to say no. <laughs> yes. You just you need that person who's going to look at your work and say it needs improvement in this area and that area in this area. And I remember my freshman year in high school, I walked into the art class with a big ego because I left my grammar school as being like the best artist, you know, I was known as being an artist. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm so great. So I walked in in my high school art class. And the teacher said, I want you all to draw something. And I knew he was doing it just to see our skill level. So I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. So I drew this elk on a hill with some grass. And I was like, yeah. So I walked up there, I sauntered up to him, you know, and I was like, okay. And I put it down in front of him. And I was like, okay, go ahead start telling me how great I am, you know? And he just looked at it and he was like, it's not finished. And he handed it back to me. And I was like, what do you mean it's not finished? He was, it's not finished, go finish it. So my bubble just burst and I sat down. I was like, oh, I can't believe it. Couldn't he see the genius in my work, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but he was totally right. It was not done. And after mm -hmm. that moment, uh, my teacher, Mr. Herbert, he just, uh, my life's endeavor became to impress him. I don't care what anybody else said about my work. I just needed to hear from him that it was good. So that caused mm -hmm. me to work harder and harder and harder. And my eighth grade year, I mean, my freshman year, he had a couple of my pictures hanging on the bulletin board behind him, you know, the good work bulletin board. But I never really heard him say, wow, that's amazing. So that became everything to me. And so uh, the end of so, the end of junior year, when we were getting ready to go on summer break, he said, OK, I want you all to be drawing over the summer. Just because you're not in art class doesn't mean it ends. You still have to be drawing. So those of you who are coming back as seniors, I expect something really great when you come in. I want to see what you've been working on. So I was like, challenge accepted, you know. <laughs> so all summer I drew and I drew and I was drawing this hawk uh, pencil drawing. I would take it to work with me. I'd work on it till eight o'clock at night. I mean, I was just obsessed because I wanted to impress him. So here at our senior year art class started and he said, okay, everybody show me what you've been doing. And all my friends were like, Ruth, go show him what you did. Go show him, go show him. So I handed him the drawing and it had a cover over it. And all my friends gathered around him and me and we're all just staring. And he kind of just looked at me like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he, he raised the, cover off of it and he saw this pencil drawing of this hawk and he just stared at it and all my friends were like Ooh. and he just looked up at me and he said that's pretty good and I was like yay I impressed my teacher so <laughs> you know and I told my students this story in my writing class because I said just like he did I'm going to push you and I'm going to expect great things from you and I'm going to challenge mm. you all year but it's not to be mean it's because I want the very best from you. Yeah. And just like he did that for me, I provided, I gave him the very best. And that drawing went on to win best in show at the state fair. 
It won all these major awards. It got me two scholarships to college. So if he hadn't pushed me and pushed me, I would have just done mediocre all those mm -hmm. all that time. But because he pushed me, I, had, I produced amazing work. So that's what a mentor and a good teacher will do. Not to, mm -hmm. They're not doing it to be mean or harsh, but they know you can do better and they know you can. And my teacher knew, he goes, I know you could do better. So a mentor will come alongside you to encourage you and to do better, to produce the very best that's in you. They mm -hmm. will know if you're just doing mediocre and they'll be like, no, I don't think so. Yeah. So in writing, whenever I, and I just talked with a young writer last week who wants to start off, she just graduated high school and she was asking me some really great questions. And uh, she asked near the end of the conversation, what tips do you have? And I said, develop a thick skin because you yeah. are going to have, you're going to get a lot of harsh feedback on your writing. That's just the way it is, the nature of the beast. And I developed a very thick skin. You know, I had one of the greatest artists in the century, um, Leonardo Soto, who came from Cuba. He taught over at ASU and he would totally rip to shreds my artwork. And, uh, but I appreciate it because he was the best of the best. And I thought, my gosh, he's looking at my artwork, you know? And he would often use me as an example because I was like one of the only art majors in the class. Everybody else were business majors and they thought we're going to take painting because it will be easy, right? Oh like, yeah. No. <laughs> so he just would go through, he'd hang up my painting. Here's what she did wrong. Da, 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 da. In front you know? of the class. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Cause I was the only art major. So he said, well, I'm going to use you. So, but by the end of that class, you know, he would insist on 15 sketches per painting. He would not be satisfied until I did 15 sketches. So he, so I could learn how to transfer what I had in my head onto paper. And after that, everything I turned in, he was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. That's great. That's perfect. And we had an art show at the end and he came to the art show and was really impressed with my work. So if he hadn't been that tough, and he was never mean, he was tough. And if he hadn't been like that, again, I wouldn't have produced my best. So I love it when I get feedback from a publisher or an editor or an agent who gives me that feedback and says, change this, fix this, do this, and it'll be great. And I'm like, yes, that's what I need to do. Does it hurt sometimes? Yeah, it does. Cause you're, you're putting your heart and soul out there. Everybody's book has a little piece of them in it, you know? Mm -hmm. But you have to learn to have that thick skin. So a good mentor will come alongside you, encourage you, give you those writing tips, but he or she will know if you are not putting out your very best and they should, you know, provide that encouragement, that nudge to put you back on that road of putting out your very best. So that's right. My best friend and I are both musicians and we always used to say, you know, people would say, can I tell you something? I don't want to offend you. And we would, we would say, <laughs> We're musicians. We're unoffendable <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because constructive criticism is just something that comes along with being a musician. If you and people will quit the arts world because they can't handle the constructive yeah. criticism. Yep. <clears throat> so you have to learn. I know that it's not going to be someone's going to be able to do it better. There's always someone who always can do it better. Always somebody better. There is always going to have be someone who has an opinion. And you get to decide if you take that opinion or not, to be honest, yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. And but if you're unwilling to take that opinion too many times, people don't want to work with you because they're mm -hmm. like, well, they aren't interested in any suggestions and they're unteachable or they're unchangeable. Now, also coming along with that, if you are like one of those top people, like you mentioned, by the time you left eighth grade and by the time you left high school and there comes that ego oh, because yeah. so much of art is performing for other people. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, I used to sing in front of the church and I would love it if someone would come up and say, Courtney, I just loved hearing your voice this morning. And I, thank you so much, you know, and here I am in front of church. It's supposed to be about God. And there was a part of me that was really excited if people made it about me. <laughs> You know, and there were some years where I actually like said, I'm not going to sing that. The, that's when I was kind of trying to figure out what it means to sing up on stage in a worship setting and not make it about me. And so I 
didn't do any kind of singing on stage. And I let myself wow. work more in the back ground yeah. because I needed to learn to be humble and not so prideful. But this is something that's really hard for us as artists because we're usually up front. So much of what we do is a performance issue. It, you know, we're performing for you said we we write so that we can be read and we we draw so we can be seen. What do you say to newer artists or authors about that ego yeah. that if they work hard enough is going to come? It's all about checking your priorities. Like you said, are you, mm. who are you doing this for? Who is your audience? I had Beth Boat. She's a really great best-selling author who is mentoring me and helping me out with a book. And it's all about the story question. That's what she's asking. When you are writing a book, you have a story question. And to get to figure out what that question is, you ask, who is the reader? Who are you writing this book for? Who needs to read this story? So who needs to see your art? Who needs to see your song? Who needs to read your story? And God has to be in that picture. He has to. If you're doing it just to make a whole bunch of money, <laughs> it will never be enough. You know, but if you're doing and the it- arts to, probably isn't the place for that. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> No, you're not going to be JK Rowling. Sorry. Right. <laughs> to right. burst that bubble. But if you're doing it just for that, you know, it will never be enough. So you have, like you said, you have those artists, those musicians who are like, I don't want any feedback. I know I'm good. I don't need it. I'm, I'm great and all that stuff. And a lot of that is that ego and Christian authors, Christian musicians fall for that too. Mm hmm. So you have to stop yourself and think <clears throat> and think, you know, who am I writing this story for? Who needs to read this story? Who needs to listen to this song? Who needs to see this painting? So for me, I, I've been in a really deep, heavy topic of opioid addiction. That's what my character is dealing with. And it's uh, PTSD from being in a war zone. And it's just, you know, she's struggling with her addiction. She's in denial. So it's a lot of a, it's a very heavy topic. So I'll take a break and I'll go write something fun, like a dragon story, or <laughs> like my, my latest release is a romantic comedy, or I'll go paint a picture. You know, I, mm. I do pet portraits, so I'm painting a beautiful dog right now, and that brings me joy and happiness. So you have that fallback, something that you can fall back on, um, where you might just sit and play the piano, right? Just for hours, just play. You're not recording it. It's not for anybody. You're just playing because you yeah. need that, that release, that artistic release. And vice versa, if I'm working on a painting that's really difficult and it's causing me some stress, I'll take a break and I'll go write something, you know, or, you know, I'm trying to learn the piano and the violin. So I'll just do that for a little while. Uh -huh. But if you, if you just, if you're taking it so seriously, you know, while wow, then, yeah, you, your, your ego is just going to get so damaged. You're going to get so damaged. And I often tell the people I mentor, Figure out who your audience is. Who are you writing this book for? Whether it's one person, some broken person who needs to know your story of redemption or restoration in God, focus on that person. Hmm. Uh, if you're just writing the story for God, write it for him, you know? Um, and so that kind of takes that pressure off of, oh, okay, yeah, I'm just going to write this story for that person out there who needs to read it, who's struggling with brokenness and needs to hear this story or read this story of wholeness in Christ. So when you, when you approach it from that angle, it just helps you get through those difficult times that critique, you know, and everything. So that's just hmm. the, that's the advice that I give, whether it's a 16 year old writer or a 25 year old writer, I just try and remind them who, who do you want to read this story? Who do you in your head, who's reading this story yeah. and write to them, write to that person. Yeah. And if the now, fame and fortune comes, praise God, <laughs> but don't uh, set out on that journey for that reason. <laughs> right, right. Well, you did just talk about your new book. So you have a new book coming out. Can yeah. you tell us about it? Absolutely. It's called The Fine Art of Love, and it's a retelling, a modern retelling of the very classic movie Pillow Talk by Doris Day okay. and Rock Hudson. And I always loved Doris Day movies. My mom and I used to watch them together all the time. And Pillow Talk always resonated with me. And I watched it over the summer. And actually, no, it was about a year ago I started watching it. 
And I thought, oh, this would be a good book for retelling. So I changed it quite a bit. It is modernized. Uh, in the movie, it's a party line. And of course, we don't have landlines anymore. So <laughs> right. I had to change the premise. So it's about Kendra Henderson, who is a fine artist. And uh, she's very successful in New York and uh, has a one-woman show and a really posh art gallery. Mm. But she lives next to a guy who is very loud and obnoxious because he is a jazz musician and he writes jingles, you know, commercial jingles. So he's always throwing wild parties late, late at night when she needs to get some sleep. So even though they've never met, he can't stand her because she complains all the time to the landlord. She can't stand him because he's just, you know, rude. Well, they just happen to encounter one another at an art show. And he sees her and he's like, whoa, she's gorgeous. But then he hears her talking to a friend about her rude neighbor. He's obnoxious and <laughs> pickable and I can't stand him. So he's like, well, I can't introduce myself as myself because she hates me. So I'm going to introduce myself as someone else. So he introduces her as Lance and uh, they fall in love. But he's thinking, when am I going to tell her the truth? Oh. I really am, right? But he likes the person he is when he's around her. He, he goes back to that love of music that he thought he lost because it was all about making money. <clears throat> and she loves being around him because he reminds her to put her soul into her art, not to just do it to mm. make money, but to really put her heart and soul into her art again. So the two of them are just doing really well, but he knows he can't keep up this ruse forever. So he's got to tell her the truth. But if he does, that's it. You know, she's not going to want to have anything to do yeah. with him. So it's about the fine art of love. Two fine mm -hmm. artists coming together. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that because you do often, inter, you know, lives intersect with, you know, artists. And you never truly understand people that are in a different discipline. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, you had the classical musicians and you had the jazz musicians and they were totally different people. Um, and then we had in college, we had our, our music building and the, the, well, see, I call it the music building. It was the art building though, or oh, the, the, the fine arts building. The fine arts building. Well, the music was the lower floor and then fine art was up top and mm. drawing, painting, sculpting. Well, occasionally one of the, <laughs> one of the, the, students from upstairs would choose to walk through the lower level instead of using the outside area that they usually used uh, to get there. And we would be like, who are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? You know, it was a small enough college that we knew, even if I didn't know you or know your name, I knew you belonged in the music world. And it's like, mm -hmm. you don't belong in the music. <laughs> <world>. <laughs> but we're very different. So I could totally very. see that like a, you know, a painter being next to a musician and man, I'm sorry, but the one thing that's really annoying is a musician that is practicing or a musician that's trying to come up with something because something new. Yep. Yeah. It's There's going to be a lot of repetition. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of, it's going to sound like noise. Yeah. <laughs> Even though and it is music. He loves wine, women and songs. So he's a playboy. Oh. So he has a different woman in there pretty much every night and he sings the same song to her, but he changes her name. You know, and she's hearing this through the wall. She's like, oh, my gosh, she's got another woman in there. Unbelievable. Who is this guy? <laughs> and so she's trying she's facing a canvas and she's trying to be all, you know, introspective to get that paint on there. And then bam, 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 you know, his loud music. And she's just like, oh, I'm going to get him thrown out of this building if it's the last <laughs> thing I do. So then, you know, and he he has invited her to come over to the parties, but she's so mousy you know and serious artist she's like no I would never do that you know so mm -hmm. her her uh, housekeeper is like I can't believe that you two have never met you know you're right next door to each other and she's like oh, I'm sure we've passed each other in the hall at some point but I don't care I don't ever want to meet him he's obnoxious you know and so he complains about her I, I don't want to meet her she's this spinster you know stays in her room stays in her apartment the whole time and I've invited her to come over but she won't come over oh my gosh wants to be alone you know so they despise each other even though they've never met so then they come together and bring out the best in each other and that's the one thing when you know he has pressed down that love of music for so many years because he just has to use it to make a living 
Mm. And she reminds him of how much he loves classical music and that he was actually writing a symphony when he was younger. And, and she challenges him to go back into that. And then she has pressed down her desire to truly express herself because she has to do what sells. She has to create the artwork that sells in the gallery. And yeah. she has almost forgotten the kind of art that she wants to produce. So he kind of challenges her. You need to start doing that, you know? So man, and there's a know. life lesson for, for real life. I mean, mm -hmm. we usually, whatever we do in life, it's, we usually start it because it's something that we love, Yes, but then it can often morph into something that, that isn't what we love anymore. And we have to remind ourselves, why did I even get, I, I'm pretty yes. sure I enjoyed this at some point, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, even things like, I think that that even happens in marriage and in parenting, yes. you know, you're like, I know that, that we chose each other and you have to remind yourself of this is the person that I loved. And it can be very easy to get lost and, and forget why you loved this person. That's why you have to keep dating your, your yes, spouse, exactly. right? And talk about those times. When right. Dating. Or even your kids. Like I chose yeah. to have kids and yes, they're really frustrating me right now, but I love them. And mm -hmm. I need to remember that in this, you know, difficult moment. Now, romance is not your normal cup of tea right no I started off writing fantasy adventure you know dragons and knights and shining armor and all that stuff adventure and then I wrote a murder mystery series for kids about ghosts um, so that was my thing you know and then um, my husband and I kind of have a unique story we were able to go to Paris France when we were first married and he I hadn't seen him in five months and so we reunited in Paris so I wrote a book about that and that was I was going to say, well, if that romance. doesn't, you know, if that's not something from a book, then I don't know what yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> that's light romance. That was fun. And then that spawned the second book, First Christmas at War, because uh, after that, he was over in Desert Storm uh, for Christmas. And so I got a, another romance out of that. But then I kind of just put romance in the back and did more fantasy Okay. Um, and really enjoyed that. And then, I don't know, I interviewed Melody Carlson, who is a best-selling, award-winning author. I mean, she's the most prolific author I've ever interviewed. Mm. She has like 300 books out. Oh, my she, gosh. Oh, yeah. She sold like 6 million copies of her books. She's just amazing. And after I talked with her, I was like, I was like, you know, you write all different kinds of genres. She's like, oh, yeah. And I said, but in the publishing industry, we're told stick with one genre, you know, yeah. and become really, and she's like, oh, I don't do that. She goes, I write whatever I want. And I'm like, you're my hero. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she has written YA books for teens. She's written romantic comedy, suspense, you know, she's written Christian fiction and she just writes whatever she wants. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's what I want to be when I grow up. So she wrote a cute little book called The Happy Camper, which is a romantic comedy. And so I kind of just bounced this idea off her. I said, what do you think about a retelling of Pillow Talk by Doris Day? And she's like, oh, you got to write that book. So I was like, yay. So she kind of encouraged me to give it a shot. And you know what? It was so fun. I wrote it for a National Write a, a Novel Month, NaNoWriMo, back in November. And so in one month, I got it down. And oh my I, I was gosh, just, wow. yeah, I was shocked at how easy it was because it was just the story I knew so well. And then to modernize it made it really fun. And I don't know, I just thought about the people who need to read this, you know, people who, like you were saying, thinking that doing this one thing is going to make them happy, but they forgot who they were and what their first love was. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's so easy to get wrapped up into that. So writers, you know, if you're going to write to make money and stuff, yeah, you probably can and you, you probably will. But I've known too many writers who they start off because it's their passion and they really want to do it. And then they just whip out these short little easy books just to boom, boom, just to keep their name out there. And and they kind of forget the first reason why they went into it, you know, and I thought, well, I don't want to be like that. So hmm. this book kind of speaks to that person who might be tempted to kind of press down their love of something just to make a living but no you you got to let it out if, if you're an artist of any form of the fine arts you got to get it out and remember your soul you know that put that soul into it you know you know you're not a millennial but I feel like that's a very millennial uh, <laughs> <laughs> message like yes I've just got to get it out and I just want to do what I love and 
yeah, that's, I'm like, man, all the millennials are going, amen, I need to read this book. That's me. <laughs> so yeah, what you said that, um, you would start some of your classes with a story and then mm-hmm. talk about your tips. So I'm going to ask you to treat us like some students here. And I would love for you to give us a couple of your best, um, writing tips for those out there that are wanting to write, whether it's a blog or short stories or they've got the great American novel in their head. What are your, you know, a couple of your best writing tips for us? Well, one of the stories I used to love to tell my students was about Kate Chopin. Um, She, I used to have my students write short stories. She was a writer back in the late 1800s um, into the early 1900s, turn of the century. As a woman back then, you know, they didn't really have a voice. They were treated just slightly above chattel. Mm -hmm. And she had suffered tremendous loss, you know, loss of her father and um, was uh, destitute and uh, having a hard time, but she had a passion for writing. She could write a story. And so she did and wrote short stories and became very famous for that. And she wasn't satisfied with just earning a living, right? She would put themes into her writing. And this is what I stress to my students and to anybody listening out there. She understood what the American woman was going through at that time, but she couldn't write directly because it would never get published. So she would take a fictional story, but put those themes interwoven into her story in such a brilliant way. And so I would have my students read and analyze the story of an hour, which was written by Kate Chopin. And it really shows you how you could tell a story about what a group of people are going through, just like Charles Dickens did with his stories, you know, the plight of the poor, you know, the orphans on the street and stuff. And just like uh, Louisa May Alcott, you know, the, the, she's my favorite, by the way. Yeah. You know, how the education system, right. Wasn't including minorities and stuff. And that was a passion of hers, but she couldn't just come right on, write that, right. So she had to just interweave it into her stories. And Kate Chopin was like that. So I used to tell my students her story because I wanted them to see that there's more to just writing a story about this person and what happened to this person. And then they had this big challenge and the end, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's what I always try to say. Don't just write a story, but put some themes in there of salvation and redemption and deliverance and hope, you know, love conquers all, whatever theme you, you feel that the reader needs to, to read, to encourage them, to get them back on their way. They might be down in the dumps, but then they read your story and there's hope. And so many women in the suffrage, suffrage movement got hope from her stories because they could identify with the woman in her story. And even though the men reading them, they didn't have a clue, the women did and they knew. And unfortunately, she didn't live long enough to see the suffrage happen and to see women get the vote. But she was one of those authors who was partly responsible for the change that came. There's power in words. There's power in the story. There's, it's not by accident that God gave us his word. He's a God of words and chose that way to communicate to us and then he created us and we are like that too words matter to us they are so important to us so if you have a story to tell that's great whether it's a you know dragon story you know or a murder mystery story or a romance doesn't matter i have those themes in all of my stories and my Mm -hmm. students used to tell me i know dragon forest isn't a christian book mrs douthat but i see some of those themes and i'm like good that's what I wanted you to see. Mm-hmm. So I tell people all the time, yeah, I'm not an outright Christian fiction author, but you will see those themes of redemption and covenant oath and faithfulness and hope and love in my stories because that's who I am, right? I have to put that in there because that's part of my being. So writing tip of the day, make sure you put those themes that matter into your stories. And that's what will resonate with your readers more than anything, more than any plot or any setting that you've chosen or any awesome character. It's those themes that matter Mm -hmm. most. And I think that's also as a reader, as an avid reader myself, that's one of those things that makes the story more interesting Mm -hmm. because what 
you, you know, what they did and who they are and their, their issue that they had, I can pretty much get that from the back of the book. Yeah. You know, or from the, I learned a new term guys, uh, <laughs> from my conversation with Ruth earlier, uh, synopsis Not, it's synopsis <laughs> summary that, yeah summary yeah. <laughs> i asked for a summary was no, i asked for a synopsis oh i asked for a synopsis <laughs> and she and before she said absolutely i can send that to you but i think what you're looking for is a summary a summary is like a recap of the story a synopsis is a breakdown of every chapter and i was like <laughs> oh no 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 <laughs> No, that's not what I need. Uh, I just need a summary. And she's like, okay. But you know, that's like what we see on the back of a book. Yeah. But those themes that you're talking about, those are the deeper things that you discover about who the character is at their core and um, how they react and respond and treat the characters around them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the beauty that you see when you're reading a, a good book you know you yeah. see those developing and you're like oh my gosh I never would have known that was going to happen because I didn't know that was a part of their character mm -hmm. you talk about Louisa May Alcott and you talk about um, Little Women my favorite book in the entire world um, I've read it many many times and but you don't know that Joe is going to have such a passion for little boys mm -hmm. you know helping such, them yeah helping them and that's not in there but then you begin to see that develop as mm -hmm. she you know gets connected with other characters so yeah I I love that advice of you know and it's even just think a little deeper don't just think yeah. some surface level exactly um, put put some of yourself I mean Louisa May Alcott had a passion for that right yeah that was her family's passion was reaching out to the downtrodden including yep. them in the education system. So she wove that into her story. Mm -hmm. Charles Dickens had a passion for helping the poor because he had once been dirt poor, yeah. you know? And so he wove those messages. And after he wrote A Christmas Carol, giving to the poor rose by like 80%, you know, after people read his book, they were wow. so overcome that they started giving to charity just because of that one story. So mm -hmm. there's power in words and your, your story can have that impact as well. That's right. Well, I am excited because you are actually not done with us here at the Journey of Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our patrons, um, we have our group over at patreon.com. Um, and it's you can find us there at patreon.com slash journey of Ruth. And that's a group of people that support the podcast and help us continue um, to, to keep going. And you are going to come on as our special guest for our February Zoom party. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very excited. Uh, yeah. So if you'd like to come join us, uh, it's February 17th. Uh, anyone is welcome, but you have to be a patron. So head over to patreon.com slash journey of Ruth. Um, join us as a patron. Uh, you can choose your levels, $5 or $10 a month to support the podcast, uh, help keep these great conversations going. And then we have uh, every few months, we have a Zoom party. And so I'm so excited that Ruth's going to come on as this next one is our book party. So we're sharing our favorite books of the year, um, talking about um, what we've read <laughs> in the last year and what we're go looking forward to reading in 2022. And then Ruth's going to be there partying with us. So Yay. I'm very excited about that. Fantastic. Uh, before we go, where can we find out more information about you and your book that's coming out? You could go to my website at www.artbyruth.com. Okay. You can find me on my author page on Facebook and my author page on Instagram, where I post constantly. And mm -hmm. you can listen to me at a Writer's Day podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you, I mean, you do re weekly episodes, correct? I, ha yeah. Ooh, I had to take a couple of weeks off, but I've got one pretty much every week in the month of February. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, regular episodes, regular content there to to consume. And um, well, before we go, we have one question that we ask all people and um, that are here on the podcast with us. And that's because we know, like we've been talking about in the art world, you're never meant to walk that path alone. It's a side by side path. So who is it that has helped you along in your journey? Oh, wow. I've had I've been blessed to have two mentors in my life. 
um, Liz Spann way back in the day helped me when our marriage was in trouble. She came alongside me and the thing she did was keep me in God's word. Mm. And so I, I praise God for her. And then my friend Ingrid Corbin was my mentor when I was a teacher. She had 20 something years experience and she came along uh, beside me when I was teaching and always gave me encouragement and great ideas, great tips to handle things. And she just was a listening ear. You know, she would allow me to just vent my frustrations and everything. She never let me wallow in self-pity, but she was always there just to listen and then give me great advice. So if you're ever going to get a mentor or I'm mentoring someone right now, but it's always good to just listen, you know, be that active mm -hmm. listener and then ask them some questions and then give them some tips. To mm. Kind of be honest with your answers, but also asking the questions and listening to giving yes. them the chance to talk as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Ruth. I am so blessed to have you here on the podcast and thank you for all that you shared. And uh, we will put links up to your website on the show notes um, on our uh, what on our website, as well as a link to how people can pre-order your book. Uh, when does it come out exactly? It comes out February 22nd and the okay. ebook is up for pre-order right now. There you go. All right. So go now, grab that book and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. 